Lord of Lords. He has met with us, and now we've come to the most important part of the service. We have with us a great lady of God, Sister Claudette Walker. She doesn't come without experience, but her whole life she has given herself to the kingdom of God, and it's reflected in her wisdom. She was pastor's wife with her husband in Odessa, Texas. Then they pastored 23 years in Cincinnati, Ohio. And from there, they went and were the overseers of the Tupelo Children's Mansion for two years, which her father was for many years. And from there, since 2001, they've been the pastorate of Faith Apostolic Church of Troy, Michigan. They also were quiz masters for 20 years, gave themselves to teaching young people the Word of God, and she herself has traveled extensively overseas around America, Canada, teaching ladies and speaking at ladies' retreats. She and her husband do marriage retreats, retreats, and this woman, most of all, is a Christian. I've known her for many years, and I'm always impressed with her sensitivity to God. She can be anywhere, and all of a sudden she will say what God just spoke to her. She's very sensitive to his voice, and God's going to use her today. I want you to stand, and I want you to welcome this awesome lady of God, and listen with your heart, listen with your mind, for God has spoken, and she will tell you what he has said. Praise the Lord, everybody. I am so excited to be here today. I'm so thankful to the Lord for his presence in this place. I give honor to Sister Joy Haney, Sister Kim Haney. I told Sister Kim Haney, I know that for three generations, this pulpit has been guarded jealously for the truth and they allow people to speak that they trust in the Holy Ghost and I consider that a great honor. Uh, CLC is probably my favorite place to preach. I love y'all, and I'm so glad to be back. Y'all are incredible. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm gonna, is, this is one of the most gorgeous pulpits. I just love it in floral arrangement, and I'm going to just add a little bit to it. How many of you have an iPhone? <clears throat> Raise your hand. An iPad? An iPod? Okay. I want to show you my iBible. <clears throat> I own this Bible. I love this Bible. I've marked this Bible up and I've read it through many times. So just to make me feel better, I'm going to put my eye Bible right there. And I'm going to put my other eye Bible right there. If you love the Word of God, if you are hungry today to hear the voice of the Lord, I want you to raise your hands and open your hearts and open your ears. God, we have come. Even though I'm teaching, I want to hear. Give us ears to hear. Touch your ears. Say, God, give me ears to hear what the Spirit is saying today. Touch your heart and say, God, make my heart good soil to receive your Word. Thank you that you would ever teach us, Lord. Thank you that you would ever allow us to hear your Holy Word. I praise you and I love you with all of my heart, God. Tell Touch these feeble lips of clay. Let your holy word come out of me untainted by my flesh, O oh God. Let it be pure, O oh God. Let it come forth with authority and anointing. I pray for scales to fall off of eyes. I pray for a spirit of revelation, O oh God, in the house today. I plead the blood. I thank you for the angels of God that are walking up and down these aisles that are surrounding this building right now. I thank you for this holy place, God. And we are coming, Lord, because we're hungry and we want to please you, Lord. We want to please you. In Jesus' name, hug your neighbor. Tell him you love him. Look him right in the eye and say, I want to guard the treasure of his presence. Tell somebody that. I want to guard the treasure of his presence. Hallelujah. Let's give him a hand clap as you're seated. <laughs> worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, I praise you. Yes. 
Several years ago, I was in a city many miles from Detroit. I had been invited to a meeting of several young ministers' wives. They were in their 20s and 30s. Some of these ministers' wives were third and fourth generation apostolics. I had inv been invited there to listen to them and to be the voice of an older woman in their lives. One night, the subject of our outward appearance came up. Things like us not cutting our hair, dressing modestly, not wearing makeup, etc. For three hours, I listened to these young ministers' wives talk. I heard the Spirit of Jesus say to me a few hours into their conversation, Claudette, try these spirits. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 in the Amplified reads, Beloved, do not put faith in every spirit, but test the spirits to discover whether or not they proceed from God. So I tested the spirits, and as I listened to them talk, they were saying things like, I resent that we have to. And I wrote down resentment. I'm so mad that we can't anger. I'm so confused. Confusion. I wonder if we really doubt. I just don't care anymore. Selfishness. You know, it's not fair that we have to. Bitterness. I wish I could. Envy. Resentment, anger, confusion, doubt, selfishness, bitterness, envy. And then I heard the voice of the Lord. These girls, Claudette, do not have an hair problem. They have a heart problem. They are not seeking to try and please me. They are seeking ways to please their flesh. And that which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. In the three-hour conversation, I had tried probably four times. I'd raise my hand and say, but what about? And I would quote scripture, and I would speak forth some revelation God had given me in my lifetime like I'm going to share with you today. But it was like the proverbial falling to the ground. Deaf ears were listening to me. Near midnight, the Lord told me three questions to ask them, and I knew he meant proverbially. Because at that point, I could tell no one wanted to hear what I had to say. He said, ask them, what prayer meeting were you in when you were on your knees and you were broken before me and you were crying out to the Lord and you were asking me for direction when you heard my voice speak to you? If you will only do whatever, it will draw you closer to me. Nobody could tell me about their prayer meeting. Number two, what fast were you on when you were trying to deny your own flesh? You were trying to die to what you think, what you feel, what you want, and what you believe. And be alive to what God thinks, what God feels, what God wants, and God believes. And nobody could tell me about their fast. Ask them what study of the word were they in when some Bible verse leaped off the page and with tears running down their faces, they saw a revelation in this holy word. If I will only do this, oh my, it'll make me get closer to Jesus. It'll make me more like him. I want to obey your word, God. And nobody could tell me about their Bible study. Because that, ladies, which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. And we've got to know what voice is talking to us. Who is speaking to you? Who is calling to you? Who is tugging on you? We've got to discern in the spirit the birthing of the lies that are coming against the truth of separation from the world in action, word, thought, and indeed. I went to my motel room that night absolutely broken hearted. 
I could not rest well. I only slept a few hours. But at 5.30 in the morning, God was so good. He woke me up with a song. And this is an old song we used to sing in Tupelo when Daddy was over the Tupelo Children's Mansion. And the Lord had just changed the words around a little bit. I can't sing, so just endure. <laughs> long ago, long ago, I'm so glad my values were settled. Long ago, my heart's at peace and I'm free today. From these values I will not stray Because my values all were settled so long ago And I laid on that motel floor and I thanked God I thanked God so much that all the things they were talking about a long time ago I had settled in my spirit I knew who I was I knew that I wanted to be apostolic I want to look apostolic, talk apostolic, think apostolic, be apostolic, speak apostolic That's who I am and that's who I'm going to die being if you agree with me, clap your hands to the Lord. And I'll tell you about this vision to try to impress you with my spirituality. It had nothing to do with spirituality. I was desperate. If you are desperate, God will paint a picture on the wall if he has to. He'll do anything to get his word through to you if you want to walk in his word. And as I was lying there on that motel floor with my face in the carpet and tears coursing down my face, wondering what in the world is going on with these young women, Lord, I saw a vision. I myself in this vision was standing in a desert and there was a storm in this desert. It was a violent storm. I could barely stand. The winds were so fierce. I was literally bucking like this underneath the force of the winds. And the sand was not just whirling toward me, but it was going in tornado-like fashion all around the desert floor and swirling. And I could hardly see because of this violent storm in this desert. But through the sand, it began to clear. And I could see a bit that there was a tent out there in the middle of the desert. And then I saw a figure that I recognized to be our Lord. And this tent had four stakes, and he had a big mallet, and he was walking around in this violent storm. And he was not swaying because he does not sway underneath the wind of anything. He is always and forevermore God and strong and who he is. You can count on him to be tall and strong in the storm. And with strength and power, he took that mallet and he went around and he pounded, pounded, pounded. One, two, three, four. The four tent stakes down deep into the desert floor. And although the tent was flapping underneath the force of the wind, it was secure because God had secured it. And so I asked the Lord the question, number one, what is the tent, Lord? And the Lord said to me, you, Claudette, would be the tent. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the tent, if you will, housed the Shekinah presence of the glory of God. But I live in the new covenant, and now you, me, we are the tent. I am the tabernacle for the Shekinah presence of the living God in this world. I move around like the tent moved around in the wilderness. I house God. You house God. We are the tent, the tabernacle of God in this new testament. What an honor you think you've seen something in a vision, it'll be backed up with the word. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 20 in the Amplified reads, Look upon Zion, for you will see a tent that shall not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be pulled up, nor shall any of its cords ever be broken. I don't care how violent the storm. I don't care what's coming against the church. We are safe as long as we allow the Lord to pound the stakes down. Number two, I said, Lord, what is the storm? He said, the storm, Claudette, are three spirits that are coming against the apostolic church today. Number one, seducing spirits, seducing us toward the world and the love of the world. Number two, doctrines of devils. And number three, the spirit of antichrist. He told me these violent, satanic storms are coming to lure my people away from three things. Number one, sacrifice. Would you say sacrifice? sacrifice. A passion for purity. And a hatred for worldly spirits. 
That's what the storms have come for. That's what they're trying to steal from the church of the living God. And then the last thing the Lord said to me about this particular part of the vision made me shudder. Satan is trying to remove the stakes from your tents and steal the Shekinah presence of my spirit in your midst. That's what he's after. He is after the Shekinah presence of God inside of me. Number three, I said, Lord, what are the stakes then? He said, the stakes, Claudette, are my holy word that are not just in your mind, but they're in your heart. And they are blitting in the fleshly tables of your heart. And I am pounding my word down deep in your spirit so you can survive this storm. There are also personal revelations that I have given you in your lifetime that have secured your belief in separation from the world securely down into the desert floor so that the storm will not move you. I was talking to Brother Mike Williams, who pastors in Orlando, Florida, at conference. My husband Mike and I were talking. He said when he first started the church there in Orlando, at just a small work and like a storefront, and there were large churches around that were growing for reasons that we wouldn't want to grow a church. I think you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, he said, I know what dad taught me. I know what I believe, Lord. But he said, I just went to my church and I fell on my face in the altar. I said, God, I just need something from you. Just, just talk to me. Help me to be able to solidify my people. And the Lord asked Brother Williams a question. He said, Brother Mike, if I gave you a, a diamond or a sapphire, a precious jewel, would you just put it out in the middle of the street or lay it on your couch or put it on the table? Or what would you do with it? I said, oh, no, Lord. If, if it was worth like thousands of dollars, I'd, I'd get me a vault and I'd lock it up because it would be wow, it'd be worth a lot of money. And the Lord said to him, the outward manifestation of your separation from the world is the vault to guard the treasure of my presence. And Mike told me, he said, I got up from there with steel in my spine and said, I don't care who says what. I know what God told me. These outward manifestations of the separation from the world are the vault to lock in his glory and his Shekinah and his presence. And I've got to have it locked up. I've got to be safe. I've got to obey the Lord. I've got to follow the Lord no matter who does what. And it settled it in Mike's spirit, who is now an elder among us, if I sound really passionate, and sometimes people, when I speak this message, have said, you sound a little mad. I want to clear something up. I am angry, Sister Haney, but not at any person. I love every person if I know my heart that has departed and gone another way. I would do anything to help them and to restore them. I love everybody. But I am angry, and I hate doctrines of devils. I hate seducing spirits. I hate the spirit of antichrist. I hate them and I will fight them with everything in my being until the day of I die to preserve this apostolic power among us. Brother Harry Haygood was an evangelist who died in the 80s. He was a young man when he died, only in his 40s. He was powerfully used of God, raised by James and Ima Kilgore in their church. He was preaching in Cincinnati, where my husband used to be on the staff. And in the middle of an evangelistic message, the Holy Ghost came over Harry and he began to prophesy. And we had recorded on cassette back then, and I diligently wrote down every word the Holy Ghost said through him and this is the prophecy in the end time now mind you this is 1976 so it was pretty far down the road before this happened in the end time the Lord said Satan is going to offer to the church a deadly mixture of enough of God to soothe their conscience but enough of the world to soothe their flesh it will however be a deadly mixture Ever hear about the Jim Jones Society and the Kool-Aid those poor folks drank? 
My God, there was nothing wrong with the Kool-Aid, but it had some stuff in it that killed several hundred people. If Sister Haney said, now, Sister Walker, we provided some water for you, and it's mostly water. We just put a little cyanide in it. I wouldn't be drinking this stuff. I'd be up here choking it and spitting because I don't want to drink a deadly mixture. I don't want to die, and I don't want to die spiritually. I don't want Satan to give me something to drink that has some truth in it, but a bunch of lies in it, and it's deadly, and it'll kill me if I drink it. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't believe the lie. And I saw the Lord in the vision then begin to pound some of his precious word that he had written on the fleshly tables of my heart. Yet a little while, the light is with you. Walk, Claudette, while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knows not whither he goeth. John 12, 35. And then the Holy Ghost said to me as his experience went on in the motel floor, Claudette, you know the spirits that were in that room last night. And I'm like, whoa, I don't think so. We ain't a talking the same. And immediately, he took me back to the seventh grade. My dad was president of the Tupelo Children's Mansion, pastor to church in town. Thank God I'm fourth generation apostolic. Jonathan is fifth. My new grandbaby is sixth. And I'm so thankful for my apostolic heritage. And I'd always been thankful till age 12. I just looked the way mama said I ought to look. I did the things dad said I ought to do. I was the preacher's kid. I went to church and I'm, I went to school and made good grades and had favorite school. And I loved all the orphans at the mansion. Life was good. But in the seventh grade, I was in math class, which bored me stiff, because I can barely do my checkbook and add numbers up, and I don't like math, so I'm just looking around. And first time in my life, a voice spoke to me. I heard it, not audibly, but I heard it, just like you hear the voice of the Holy Ghost in your spirit. I heard a voice, but it was not holy, and it said to me, Claudette, your hair is ugly. And I remember looking down at my Calvary bow. My hair had never been cut. And, and the cool, uh, Sister Haney would know, the cool thing in those days was to roll it up like this. Roll it going around. It's called Calvary roll. And they had little bangs, you know, pulled around. And it was really cool. And apostolic you were in if you had a Calvary roll. Well, I looked around the seventh grade classroom in the public school, and nobody had a Calvary roll. Billy Heddington, who was a cheerleader and really cool, she had her hair cut up to here. She had little flips there, and she had bangs to there. I looked at her hair, I looked at my hair, and the voice said, you're ugly. And I remember thinking, wow, that was all. A few weeks later, I went to Miss Haynes' class. She was the one who taught home economics, and uh, she passed out this little bag at the end of class. It had lotion in it. It had some Kleenex, some little toiletry stuff. And I got home, and Mom and Dad were down there raising orphans, and I was up in the little house on the hill all by myself, and I opened up the bag, and I looked inside of it, and in the bottom of it, lo and behold, was a tube of lipstick. I'd never touched one in my life. A tube of lipstick, and I turned it over on the bottom. It said, Wild Rose. <laughs> and standing in my bedroom at the Tupelo Children's Mansion, the voice. It was very close. It was on the right side. It was always on the right side. Right here, it said, You're pale. And I looked in the mirror, and I thought, my God, I look like I'm ready for the casket. <laughs> so I listened to the voice. I got out the thing, locked the door in case Mama came home from the mansion. Locked the door, got out the wild rose, started putting it on. Now I look like a clown because I didn't know how to do it. But when I looked in the mirror, the voice said, you're beautiful. All you needed was a little color. So instead of putting it in the garbage where I knew I should have, I opened my underwear drawer and slid it real far back underneath my slips just in case I had another pale day. <laughs> Next thing happened, I went to school and I noticed I grew up in the era of minis and micro minis. I noticed that mama always made my skirts below my knee. And I happened to notice that all my girlfriends at school had skirts that barely covered their posterior. And I went to the bathroom, there was a long mirror, and nobody was in there but me. Law on school, I looked in the mirror, and I'm like, hmm. What, the voice said, could possibly be wrong with showing a little knee? And I thought, yeah, what could? So I went in the stall, locked the door. <laughs> Just 
just about a half a knee. I went out feeling a lot more cool with it. I was president of the Y Teens, and the biggest claim to fame in Tupelo is that Elvis Presley was born there. There was an Elvis Presley Teen Center on a Friday night. Every now and then, I would have to go and, and, and work doing refreshments for everybody, whatever they were doing. And one of their activities was they had a dance. Now, this was 1964, and the big dance of those days was the twist. Now, they're all out there dancing, and I'm not going to dance because Dad said we don't dance. They're all out there twisting. But there was an opening through the, the kitchen that I could see them, and I'm stirring boiling hot dogs and watching them dance through the twist. They were all going... And the voice... The spirit, the demonic spirit, might as well name it now in the beginning, instead of the end of rebellion, stood right there and said, what could possibly be wrong with going? And I thought, yeah, my God, what could be wrong with that? So they're out there doing it, and this spirit of resentment that I couldn't do, it's in my heart. And so I thought, Bless God, I'll twist and stir. So I'm stirring hot dogs. Going, dun, 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 dun. It sounds funny, but for two and a half years, it was not funny. This voice stalked me. This demonic spirit of rebellion who had set itself up to steal everything good out of my life nagged me. It made fun of me. It told me I was ugly. It said I didn't belong at school. It said I didn't belong at church. It was stealing everything good out of my life. And I was listening to the voice. I was agreeing with it in my spirit. I was the proverbial hypocrite that everybody thought I was a good preacher's kid, but I'm at church just going through the motions wishing I could get out of there. I'd go to school and wish my skirt instead of half my knee, I could do it all the way up. Oh, my spirit was getting uglier by the day. It lasted two and a half years. I was just on the verge of turning 15 the summer of 1965. My brother said, let's go to Tennessee youth camp. I had no desire at that point to go to more church. But when my brother would go to Nashville and visit Brother Cleveland Beckton's church, I'd go with him. And there were some fine-looking boys in that youth group. Mm. And I felt the burden to go to youth camp. Because there was one blonde, six-foot-three, brown-eyed, tan, muscular, holy boy. That I thought I might could get interested in me. Maybe he'd buy me a hot dog and a hamburger at the concession stand and sit with me in church, as in those days. I don't know why they allowed it, but they allowed you to do it. And sure enough, I got some thrills because he asked me out. He bought me a hot dog. And we sat in church. The only thrill I got all week was that we'd fold our hands like this. Put my hand there. He put his there, and we'd touch fingers during the preaching, and I'd feel chills. <laughs> Woo! Woo! He's so good looking. I don't know what the preacher said on Thursday night. I wish I could remember. But I don't guess it matters. Because he said something under the unction of the Holy Ghost. That after two and a half years of Claudette Walker backsliding, fourth generation apostolic, backsliding in my heart away from everything I knew to be true and holy and good. And I was miserable. Caused me to think, you know, I probably, before I check out, should go talk to God about this. And I made my way down to an altar. It wasn't beautiful like this gorgeous carpet. It was a concrete floor with sawdust on it. And I put my face down on the sawdust the first time. In two and one half years, I was honest with God. It was not a spiritual prayer. It was a very selfish prayer. I just said, God, I'm tired of being miserable. I was. I didn't have any real big desire to be holy or get right with God. I just started out that way. I'm telling you, just start talking. It doesn't matter. Just start talking to God. Maybe you'll stumble on something. Maybe you'll stumble on something in your prayer that God can work with. And I buried my face in that sawdust and I said, God, I'm miserable. I'm miserable at school because daddy won't let me be like them. And I'm miserable at church because I don't want to be like them. I'm only 14 and I got to live in this house four more years. And I'm just sick. I feel like I'm a hypocrite, God. And I don't know if you can help me or not. And I don't even know what's wrong with me. But I said, God, if you will take 
And now I'm getting serious and I'm starting to cry. If you will take, and I didn't know what to say, but all of a sudden the Holy Ghost spoke through me. And he filled in the blank. And I said, Lord, if you'll take, and I'm stumbling, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm asking, take, take. And he said, the love of the world. And I'm like, oh. Okay, Lord, if you will take this love of the world out of my heart, then I'll serve you. But if you can't, I'm sick of being a hypocrite. And I'm crying, Jesus, can you do anything with my heart? Oh, my God. I don't know what I did, but I touched some cord in heaven. And I said, God, help me. And when you give the Lord, who's the greatest heart surgeon, sister Haiti, who ever lived, permission to slap you on his surgeon table, get out his knife, rip into your heart, and pull out the root of the love of the world, he will do it. When I came to at midnight, there was nobody, Sister Haney, in the tabernacle but me. Now, I'm not telling you that say I was spiritual. I told you how backslid I was two and a half years, but they were all gone. Sister Hogue, I had my face down there. The Holy Ghost was talking through me. I got up. And, I tell you, people, it felt like a 10,000-pound weight had been lifted off of my chest, and I could breathe, and the voice was still. There was no demonic presence anywhere near me. It was 50 years ago this coming July. I'm here to tell you, if you are somebody you know is struggling, God, in one honest prayer, can deliver you from the love of the world. He can yank it so out of your heart that you will never, ever struggle with it again. I'm here to testify. 50 years later, the surgery is still working. Two and a half years, I was filled with doubt, anger, bitterness, selfishness, envy, arguments, and confusion. Exactly the same spirits I had felt coming out of the mouths of those young ministers. Wives. I was over the YT Council, so when I went back home, I knew I was going to have to lead the meeting for the new high school I was going to. I came in and thought, well, I'll, it worked at camp. That was, they called, used to call it Holiness Hill in Tennessee. It worked on Holiness Hill, because everybody there was holy. But I'll probably have some serious problems when I go back to school. And I see all my girlfriends, and I'll start feeling like I used to, like I wish I could be like them, think like them, act like them, whatever. But I prayed, God, please help me. Put on my long dress, knee always covered, and not rolled up, showing half my bony knee. Didn't put on my wild rose lipstick to go to the meeting. Didn't snap at my hair, just went like it was. Started the meeting with, well, what happened this summer, girls? Tell me about your summer. What happened? Never forget the one girl. She's like Mary Ann. She's like, oh, oh, Claudia, you won't believe what happened to me this summer. You know so-and-so at school? It's a real cool, good-looking guy we all thought was cute. Yeah. Yeah, well, in the back seat of his car. <laughs> but I tell you, I was so drunk when I came to. I vomited all over the guy, and they're all going, ah, ha, 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 And I said, um, excuse me just a minute, I, I need to go to the restroom. And I'll never forget, I went in the restroom, and I looked at my apostolic Calvary roll. I looked at my long skirts. I looked at my pale face, and I raised my hands, and I said, Jesus, thank you for delivering me from the love of the world. Thank you for ripping it off. Thank you for letting me see the underbelly. Thank you for telling me he wanted me to go this summer to the back of the seat with that car, with that guy. You were saving me. You were saving me from sin. You were saving me from debauchery. You were saving me, oh God, from filth. You were saving me. You saved me. You saved me. You saved me. I want to be apostolic my whole life. I want to look different, act different, be different, think different, talk different. God, you're a great Savior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First John 2.15. Love not the world. I watched him in the vision pound this verse that he had emblazed on my spirit when I was 15. Claudette, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
him. You better get you some verses out of this holy book that aren't just passing through your head. You better get them down in your heart. You better make a mistake in your life where God can pound them, pound them deep inside the desert floor to protect you from the storm. I married a best man ever walked in shoe leather, and we went to Odessa, Texas to be with the J.T. Pugh's youth pastor. He graduated from Gateway after he went to secular college, and my dad at that point in time was president of Gateway College. There was a singing group there. My Lord, two sisters and a brother. When they sang, especially the one girl, they sang under such a powerful anointing and authority. It was the kind where you thought your skin was going to melt off your body. We had fun, and we liked boys, and we acted crazy. I was in their weddings, and they weren't my wedding. But, but on Thursday, we'd fast. I'd go to Gateway, and we'd fast. And we would lay on their trailer floor, and we'd see God. We were close in the spirit. We agreed. We were on the same page. We were walking in the same place. We then went to Cincinnati, Ohio, where my husband joined the staff with Brother Pasley. A couple years into it, I got a call from this girl and her husband who wanted to come by and visit us. We were thrilled. I hadn't seen him in a couple years. I remember when I opened the door, the house all clean, opened the door, and I saw this woman who had one of the most powerful anointed singing voices I've ever heard in my life. Hair used to sweep the back of her knees. I opened the door, and I used to hear. She looked like a clown. And I said, hi. I went, hi. And I hugged her real big so I could seal the tears. I'm like, I'll be back in a minute. I'm always going to the bathroom to cry. Excuse me. Go to the bathroom. I'm like, help me get through this, my Lord. What happened? We're sitting at the table, and pretty soon they start in their sermon, which you've heard a thousand times, so I won't preach the whole sermon. Claudette and Marvin, we know you are studying the grace of God, and you want to know about the grace of God. Well, we have found it. And you, Claudette and Marvin, are in, somebody fill in the blank, bondage. Heard the sermon preached. Listened to it in politeness with our ears, not with our hearts. My husband said, I love you. Always have, always will. Couldn't disagree more. Gave scriptures that we've trying to live our life by. Parted ways. And I heard in the spirit as the vision was still going on and God's replaying all these events in my life. Titus 2, 11 and 12. They told me they were in grace and I was in bondage. And this is when God taught me Titus 2, 11 and 12. And he pounded the stake deep inside of my spirit. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a demonic lie. You are not in bondage. You are free. They're the ones who are in bondage. We are free to walk in the Spirit. We are free to be saved from sin. We are free to be saved from the world. We are free to be saved from demonic spirits. We are the ones who are in freedom, and they're the ones who are in bondage, and that is the truth. My husband and I were invited to speak at the First National Youth Congress. 1979. We each did a couple sessions, and after the final big session, I this had just happened with my friends, and I was seeking the Lord. I said, God, I, I know what I believe, but we're teaching young people now all over the country and other parts of the world. Would you please give me something else? I, I just need something else, Lord. I, I have your word, but, but I'm asking you just for something else. Just speak something else to me, Lord. And not long after that, the Lord laid me to a cassette tape of Brother Tom Barnes. Those of you who don't know, one of the greatest prophets of this century gone to be with the Lord. Very close to your pastor in Haney. But the Barnes in this cassette said that in the early 60s, when the Jesus movement started out here in California, Jesus people, hippies get the Holy Ghost and stuff, and then out in the East Coast where I live, in Catholic universities, the Holy Ghost began to be poured out. Before this, in mass, in America at least, 
apostolic, Pentecostals, and Assemblies of God people basically were the groups that were filled with the Holy Ghost. Nobody else believed in it. Nobody else really wanted it. But we began to read about it in the newspaper. All this started happening, and, and, and yet they didn't, uh, many of them believed yet in the oneness, and they, they didn't look like us and whatever. So the Barnes was seeking God. He said, God, show me. Are you really filling these people with the Holy Ghost, and, and what do I tell my people and whatever? And God gave Brother Barnes a vision of a huge mountain. He said it was a very tall mountain, very steep and very hard to climb. And Brother Barnes and his flock of people were not at the summit, but very near the top because they had been climbing and struggling in this mountain of holiness for many, many years. And then all of a sudden, Brother Barnes said he heard at the base of the mountain throngs of people receiving the Holy Ghost and talking in tongues. And he turns around and looks. And God said, you ask me what to do, I'll give you three instructions. Number one, don't ever, I am filling them with the Holy Ghost. Don't ever pick up a rock because they don't look like you, act like you know everything you know yet. Don't you pick up a rock and throw it at them as they're trying to climb. Number two, he said, when they get near you, reach out a hand and help them. It took you a long time to get where you are. Talk to them about the oneness. Talk to them about separation from the world. Instruct them in the ways of holiness, those that will listen. Help them get closer to my holiness. And the third instruction I will never forget because it's what I was needing to hear. He said, however, just because I am blessing them, Brother Barnes, don't you ever think that you and your flock can turn around and go down the mountain back to where they are and have my approval on you. Don't ever, ever, ever turn around and go back down the mountain. <laughs> Sister Kim Haney, if you could come and help me, sweetheart. We go, this is the mountain, okay? And I, I've, been, I've been up doing this a long time, and I'm, I'm up near the top. I've been apostolic a long time. She's a new convert, okay? We're going to bring her over here. Isn't she beautiful? She's got saved. We're so glad you got the Holy Ghost, sweetheart. Hallelujah. She's right here. She wants to walk with God. Everything anybody tells her, she's like, yes, yes, I want to know, whatever. She's reaching toward God. She's praising God. She's wanting to climb the mountain of holiness. You just stay right there, angel. And I'm up here. I'm, this is the mountain, okay? Because I'm up there. I'm up there, and, and I hear Sister Haney talking in tongues. She's got on a short skirt and wild rose lipstick. And I'm like, my God, I'm getting older. I need a little help. Maybe I need a little wild rose lipstick. God's blessing her, my Lord. Fully on this climb in this mountain bit. God's blessing her. I'm turning around from back to where she is. She's coming, come darling. She's coming. You get to me, stop, raise your hands. She's climbing the mountain. She's doing everything she knows. She's walking all the truth that's been revealed to her. She's heading that way. She's heading toward holiness. She's heading toward separation. She's heading toward victory. She's heading toward everything. She has a pure heart and a clean heart. The rapture takes place, and I've decided that something is pulling me down the mountain, but it ain't God. It's the love of the world. It's the flesh calling me down here. And I'm right here, and my heart's going toward selfishness, and my heart is going toward the love of the world. And the rapture takes place. I wouldn't want to be in my shoes because two shall be in the field. One taken, one left. Two grinding at the meal. One taken, one left. Don't ever think apostolics. You can turn around and go back to they are and have the blessing of God. Walk in the light while you have the light. Lest darkness come upon you. Thank you, sir. Ha. Stand up a minute. I'm not done, so don't get excited. Let's just stand and clap. If you got that little illustration, clap. If you promise God, I'm never going down the mountain. I'm never going to buy the Kool-Aid. I'm never going to drink it. I'm never going to believe that if I walk in my flesh, I'll get closer to God. I've got to pray. Praise God, you may be seated. Let's, I'm out of steam here just a minute. Let's just pray in tongues if you would. Mm. 
Then in my vision, after the Lord reminded me about Brother Barnes and his vision and the vision I was having, I saw the Lord with his mallet out in the storm in the desert, pounding this stake deeper into the desert floor that he gave me all those years ago. First John 2, 16 and 17. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. It's of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Hallelujah. Let's praise God for his holy word. He has not left us without stakes. We've got stakes in here that are strong. We've got stakes in here that will hold you down in any storm the devil sends. But you've got to get it in your heart. You can't just have it in your mind. You've got to get it in your heart. Oh, Jesus. Which direction are you moving? What voice is talking to you? There was a church quite a few years ago that had been in apostolic movement. UPCI over 50 years. The pastor got a revelation that he thought our standards of outward separation, and particularly for women, were barring, his exact words, were barring thousands of women from coming into the kingdom. So his simple logical reasoning, Sister Haney, was if we let these barriers down, why then these thousands of women who really love Jesus just don't want to line up to our ways of how we look and think and act and talk and whatever. They can just come rushing into the kingdom. So he told the church. It's your church. You've paid tithes here 50, 60 years, some of you. So what do you think? It's a business meeting. A young minister who was anointed of God and had seen, this is not a new wave, people. This started in Genesis. These are old waves. Had seen the last wave of this emergent spirit they call now come through. So he stood up and in respect, he said, Pastor, he was crying. He said, I'm so afraid. I'm afraid, Pastor. Some of my friends did this back in the 60s. And they don't get the Holy Ghost in their churches anymore. And they don't baptize in Jesus' name. He said, oh, Pastor, I'm so afraid that you're putting our church on a very slippery slope. And the pastor in anger reacted and banged the pulpit with both fists and went, I get so sick of hearing that. This is not a slippery slope. It is not a slippery slope. And he did his thing. He removed his church from this holy fellowship of believers. I'm here to tell you people. The slope, I'm 64, okay? I'm not a kid anymore. The slope that may have been like this, the first wave I remember when I was just a young teenager. When it came around and that holy anointed singer of God was like it, it was about like this. The trajectory, can't talk, trajectory, thank you, Lord, of the slope is getting ever more slippery. Folks, it's about like this now. It's about like this. You better be careful what icy slope you put your little boat posterior on and think that you're going to be able to make it for God and not end up at the bottom of the heap like everybody else that I've ever known that's gone this way has lost absolutely everything apostolic. I'm going to be plain. They're plain, so I'm going to be plain. In the last 10 years, I'm going to tell you where some young men have gone, young ministers, that preached it because of the times at our National Youth Convention and in some of our biggest camps in the summer. Set themselves on that slippery slope 10 and less years ago. Here's what they say now. One has recently posted in the last year on his blog Marriage, of course, can be between a man and a woman, but God loves the gays, and you come to our church, it's okay. He 
another pastor, one of our powerful apostolic churches who put his church on that slippery slope, was in the altar praying with a new convert. The youth minister heard it. It's what made him leave. Thank God for the youth minister. Heard the pastor say to this new convert, she's praying, wanting the Holy Ghost. She stops and goes, Pastor, now when I get the Holy Ghost, will I speak in tongues? He said, well, you may or you might not. You don't have to. And the youth minister said, ding a ling 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 The alarm went off. Honey, ask God to put an alarm system underneath your chair. And every time you hear something wacko like that, you run, you run for your life. And thank God that youth pastor ran. And he's raising up a holy church in a city. But the pastor stayed. And they believed next to nothing. Another one who preached it. Youth Congress. Now, when you come to his fellowship if you want to be baptized in Jesus name that's cool he'll do it yeah go ahead next guy in line titles please okay in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost and right on his what we believe three gods co-eternal co-existent and co-equal oh my god talk about a spirit of deception talk about Satan coming to steal everything from us it is happening. You want to go to his social? Well, the church will provide the wine. You just bring your dancing partner and be it your wife or your girlfriend. The slope is slippery, people. And Satan is out to steal everything apostolic from us. And what he wants the most is the Shekinah presence of the living God. And that we've got to guard. We have got to protect. We've got to do everything we can. You've heard Brother Stone King say it. He preaches here a lot, but I'll repeat it for those who may not have heard. Brother Stone King says, if a man deceives you, we can reason with you. We can talk to you. We can reason because it's a logical process. Talk you out of your deception. If the devil deceives you, we can cast that devil out of you. If you're sincere and don't want it there anymore, I'm talking to you. But if God... read out of my eye Bible what he read. This is the Amplified. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan and will be attended by great power and with all sorts of pretended miracles and signs and delusive marvels, all of them lying wonders, and by unlimited seduction to evil and wicked deception, those who are going into perdition and perishing because they did not welcome the truth. They refused to love it so they could be saved. Therefore, God, everybody say God. God sends, everybody say God sends. God sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error, a strong delusion to make them believe what is false in order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe, who refused to adhere to, trust in, and rely on the truth, and instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. Had a girlfriend come by telling me how free she was since she had left all this bondage. She felt so free. She felt so free. I called my pastor, Brother Pesley. I said, Brother Pesley, my God, what's going on? Does she feel free? He said, oh, yes, she does. She does. She's not lying. Because the word of God is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Ooh, we love those parts. Ooh, sweet. Mm, I like those parts, too. I'd rather hear a sermon like that any day. But it is also for rebuke, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. And when the holy light of God shines on you, and I look in here and say, Oh, my God, I had a bad attitude. i got to repent. I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I did that. And you are living constantly in the brightness of the conscience and the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Honey, and all of a sudden you decide, That's too hard a life. I don't want that anymore. Bye-bye light. And you turn around. And you start walking, you feel kind of free because you don't have that blinding word in your face anymore. You're free. But Brother Pasley said, now you're free to begin to walk toward utter darkness. Free to walk in darkness. And I heard the Lord, Galatians 1, 8, 11, and 12. 
though us or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that we've preached to you, let him be accursed. The gospel which was preached is not of men. For I didn't receive it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Walk in the light while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. We've got to love this light, Sister Anita Sergeant. We've got to love it. We've got to cherish this truth. We've got to cling to it. We've got to hold to it. We've got to guard it. We've got to treasure it. We are the protectors of the Shekinah presence of the living God. We are the protectors of apostolic truth doctrinally and in separation from the world. We have got to guard it. We've got to guard it. The same era when we taught at the youth convention, the Lord told me to go home and study the life of Prince Charles. This is pre-die day. He was in college. Nobody knew who he was except that someday if his mama died, he was going to be the king of England. One book I read about Charles says from his birth, Charles has had colossal advantages of wealth and power, which from a child he has worn, he has evidently worn shackles, which most humans would never endure. Colossal advantages Charles has, but he's had to endure shackles. None of the other boys in England had to endure. Things like he grew up in the hippie generation, but Queen Elizabeth wouldn't let Charles have a ponytail. And the reason she gave him was, you're not like the other boys, son. You're, you're a prince, and someday you're going to be their king, so... Go get a haircut. He couldn't go to the pub and get drunk. Have his name displayed all across the tabloids. And she'd tell him, it's because of who you are. You're a prince, Charles. He dresses weird. He still does. He's got one valet just to put his 20-something uniforms he has together. If he's going to the Navy thing, yes, has a Navy uniform. He's going here, going there. Got all these uniforms. And they got braids. They got buttons. They got bows. They got all kinds of stuff. Takes one valet just to keep up with putting the guy, all of his weird stuff on him, right? And when he goes out, nobody else in England is dressed like that. He's walking around. Everybody goes, oh, I know who that guy is. He's the prince. He's going to be the king of England someday. Now, all this weirdness in his life. It's because he's a prince in training, and he may reign over one small nation in one little continent in just one world in millions of God's galaxies, and all that's if his mama dies. My God. Guys jump through those hoops his entire life and may never, ever get to be king. Or if so, he may be 90 with one foot on the world and the other on the grave and the banana peel. You know, I mean, it's really sad that he's sacrificed his whole life and trained for something that not going to last long. You know who I am? <laughs> Woo! My name is Princess Claudette K. Walker. My daddy is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And someday I'm going to rule and reign with him world without end. And therefore, my training has to be very rigorous. It has to affect how I look, how I think, how I feel, how I act, how I talk, how I walk. Not to put shackles on me because I'm so special. You are so special. There are very few people in California like you. You're in training to be princesses. Before this conference is over, the rapture could take place. And we could begin to rule and reign with Jesus Christ's world without end. And you tell me you don't want to look different, act different, talk different, think different. Are you kidding me, baby? I'll have to put on that prince's garb any day. Walk around with my velvet robe and my ermine cape and my scepter of power over demonic spirits in my hand. <laughs> Say, I'm a princess. I saw a vision of the grace of God one day, and it was in the form of a beautifully wrapped package. The package was huge. It was the grace of God. It was red, which I thought represented the blood of Jesus. It had a big gold bow on top and it had a price tag on the side. Dollar sign. I'm like, that's cool. I always wonder what the grace of God was going to cost me. I got up real close and read it. You know what it said? Dollar sign. Grace of God. Price. Nothing. Whew. Hallelujah. Sister Haney, I was so relieved. I'm like, well, thank God. And that's true. You tell me how many prayers you can pray to kneel at the foot of that rugged cross and earn one drop of blood. How much can you fast to be worthy that God would forgive you of some filthy sin you just committed? Tell me how much you could knock on doors. How many souls could you save to make you worthy? No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. When you kneel at the foot of the cross, 
All you can do is say, just as I am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, nothing, 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 absolutely nothing you can do to earn that. And I got closer, it said nothing and everything. Initially, nothing. Eventually, everything. Because you'll want it to. You'll be so crazy in love with this God who gave you unmerited salvation that anything he hints at, you'll want to do it. You will love him so much that you'll want to give your life, your time, your all, your energy, your strength. You'll want it to cost you everything. My husband and I were blessed to go on the trip to Israel with the wonderful Hanes and people from CLC. We re renewed our vows of looking over the old city of Jerusalem. Now, wouldn't it be plumb and perfectly stupid if I'd have said to Marv, you know, honey, we've been doing this 40 years, and I'm really, you know, I love you, but if you could just make a list for me of anything that if I do that, you're going to divorce me for, and anything if I don't do it, you're going to divorce me for, and I, I'll live with those parameters, but anything else, please. I mean, we've been doing this 40 years. I mean, I've been trying to please you for 40 years. Just make it plain to me. And anything that's not in those parameters, I'll, I'm going to do what I want to do. What kind of a love relationship would that be? Duh. Oh, no, after 40 years, I'm so crazy in love with this man. I had an outfit. It was kind of new. This is old. I've been wearing this for 12 years. This is a 12-year-old blouse. I had a new cute one. I liked it. I thought it looked cute. And I thought I'd look sort of in style maybe a little bit today, Sister Bailey. You know, it was just more of the style. So I said, honey, do you like this? I pulled it out at the motel last night. And he goes, yeah, it, it's good. But I could tell he didn't think I looked absolutely gorgeous in it. So I stuck it back in the closet. I know he likes this. I put on my 12-year-old blouse. Because I don't care if you think I look pretty or not, but I'm so in love with Marvin Walker. If he just hints that maybe he likes something or doesn't like, I want to do it. 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 I want to please him. I love him. He's the passion of my life and the best man ever walked in shoe leather. Come out from among them and be ye separate. I saw the Lord pounding the stapes and touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. I'll be a father unto you and you'll be my sons and daughters. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the eyes of God. This is free. I'm not going to charge you for this. I'm glad y'all had that break. I'd be feeling like we ought to go, but I'm going to finish the message God gave me and we're going to have a deliverance service and we're going to go eat there's food on the way had a lady tell me that in order to understand first Corinthians I'll get this I Bible 11 she said Claudette you need honey to study again you need to get deep in the Greek To really understand Paul's message on hair. Well, now, I didn't know Greek when I was 14. I didn't barely know English. Joy and Kim Haney had not written books. Brother Bernard had not written a book. Brother Norris had not written a book. Lori Wagner, Nan Pamer, none of those people who have given us wonderful books on this subject were written. I'm 14. And I just promised God at the Tennessee altar, I will never cut my hair again. God, forgive me, but I did snip me a few bangs. I would hide them underneath until I got on the bus and then I'd pull them out. <clears throat> So I told God, I'll never do that again, but I didn't understand. I said, Daddy, can you help me with the hair thing? Because I want to understand when my girls at school asked me why I got the Calvary roll. He said, go read. He had a bunch of orphans to raise. He was busy. He said, go read 1 Corinthians 11. Okay. So I went to my bedroom. I read 1 Corinthians 11. Here's five words why I'll never cut my hair. Chapter 6, for if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame, everybody say shame. My God, I didn't have to read any further. I understand shame. And if something's a shame to my God, I love him so much, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with cutting hair if it's a shame to God. It settled it in my 14-year-old heart. I got down to verse 10. For this cause, not a woman to have power. Everybody say power. power. On her head because the angels say angels. angels. Didn't understand all that. Can't pretend I still deeply maybe understand all of it deep in the Greek. But what I get is that if I will not cut my hair, I'm going to have some kind of power with God. And some kind of angels are going to hang around me and be pleased to be with me. That, that, that'll do it. Got to verse 15. But if a woman have a long hair, it's a glory. Everybody say glory. glory. For it is given to her for a covering. Say covering. 
my God, I need all the covering I can get from the storms that are going on in this world today. And I need all the glory of God over my life. Sign me up right here. Never cut my hair again. It's a shame to you. And if I do obey the word of the Lord, I'll have power. I'll have angels. I'll have covering. I'll have glory. And you don't have to be deep in the Greek to get that. You can be a teenager and get a revelation in your spirit that you love this truth. One more before I close. Can you really tell me, Sister Walker, that this is a heaven or a hell issue? God, I'm so sick of that question. How stupid! Goes back to the divorce issue. Who cares if it's a heaven or hell issue? I know what pleases the Lord according to his word. I know what doesn't please him. So I'm going to obey the word of the Lord. What kind of relationship have I better walk with him if I'm just trying to stay out of hell? That was free. You don't have to leave a tip at the door. And I am closing. My mother and dad were married 70 years last September. Like one half of 1% of people are married like 70 years. So we went down to Tupelo to take them up to a little lodge on the river and celebrate for a few days. And I had to go to the post office that morning, so I thought I don't get a chance to go back to Tupelo real often. I'll take a trip down memory lane. And I had my little camera and my phone, and I was just going to go take a few pictures. And hospital where I was dying when I was 17 and God raised me up from kidney failure and just back to my church just gonna take a memory drive just sweet little drive and so I went by Law Hon High School where for three years I lived there like I described to you miserable demonic spirit of rebellion talking to me every day in every class and all day long and then the Lord took me to the high school I'd been delivered we went seven eight nine one school across town I got delivered the summer of 65 and then I went to the high school 10, 11, and 12. I pulled up from the high school and the Lord asked me a question. He said, Claudette, what was the difference between junior high and high school? Well, the answer was one prayer meeting I described to you. One powerful deliverance from a demonic spirit changed my entire world so that my thought process in high school was totally different. God had done everything. I'm going my way to pick up my mom and dad. I have to go to the bathroom. I don't think I can make it to their house. And so I pull into this place, and I don't realize where I am. And all of a sudden, they've redone it because I hadn't been back in a while. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is where I did the twist. da 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 stirred the hot dogs. It was the Elvis Presley Youth Center. I'm like, well, hallelujah, y'all go in there, use the bathroom. That'll be cool going down memory lane. So I went in the Elvis Presley Center, and I uh, asked the lady, I don't want to go to your museum. could care less, but I need to use your bathroom. She goes, cool, go in the bathroom. I go in the bathroom. There's this huge video screen. And there's Elvis. Not young Elvis, old Elvis, fat Elvis, <laughs> drug addicted Elvis. He, he's everywhere at that museum. He's even in the bathroom. So after he used the bathroom, I came out and he was singing his theme song, which is the theme song of this generation. My husband Googled it for me. I'm only going to read three stanzas of the seven, but listen to the words. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I planned each charted course, every careful step along the byway. And more, much more than this, I did it my way. And what is a man and what is he got if not himself? He has not to say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. Oh, my God, talk about brazen. He has the right to say what I feel and not to say the words of one who kneels. Talk about an affront in the face of God. The record shows I took the blows and I did it my way. And I'm standing in that bathroom and tears, ladies, are pouring down my face because Elvis... Until he was 13, lived in Tupelo. I went to school with a lot of his cousins. I saw him when I was in the fifth grade. He came into my classroom because he loved my teacher. She helped him start singing. I went to school with a lot of Presleys, first generation Presleys that were spirit filled. When I came out of the bathroom, she said, Oh, have you got time to go visit Elvis's church? 
Now, I thought I didn't, but I text mom and dad and said, I think I got to do this. I said, what are you talking about? She said, oh, we've brought the little Church of God church where Elvis used to go until he was 13. And we've got in here, and we've got an old piano in there, and we've got this film, and we reenact what services were like for Elvis when he was a boy until he was 13. I'm like, sign me up, $8, 15 minutes. I sit up there, and I asked the lady, nobody's playing the piano. And I said, could I please go play the piano? There's only three of us in there. I mean, it's a little museum. She goes, yeah, it's cool. So I'll go up front, and I start going. I'm crying thinking about 14 year old Claudette and 13 year old Elvis and I'm playing and I'm singing I'm so glad I turned my eyes upon you Jesus I'm so glad I look full in your wonderful face and all the things of this world they grew so strangely dim and I'm crying and I'm a worshiping she goes honey now stop we can start the film I'm like cool and I sat in the back row so I could watch. And they had the songs Elvis used to sing until he was 13 years old. They had pictures of his mama who had dresses down to here. And her hair was rolled up in a cavalry roll. She was full of the Holy Ghost. She would speak in tongues. Elvis got the Holy Ghost in that church. They talked about how they would sing until midnight. And how the Spirit would move. And they would worship in tongues. And they would give prophecies. And the Holy Ghost would move. Now granted they were Trinity and did not have the revelation of the oneness. But that's how Elvis grew up until he was 13. Then they went to Memphis. When they discovered for work, they discovered his talent and the world began to pull on this Holy Ghost filled boy until they sucked him under and all the life out of him and he dried and died in a drunken stupor. The most popular entertainer that ever lived in the world. I don't know why, I'm not an Elvis fan, but that's, he is. And so I took, I felt the Holy Ghost, my, 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 the Lord's talking to me, my mom takes her, I'll be there in a minute. And there was a statue of a boy, 13. He had his guitar slung. It was Elvis at 13. He had his guitar slung and he was, had his sights set toward Memphis. Sister Haney, I can't tell you what it did to me to stand there with the greatest entertainer that ever lived and realize up until 13, he had the Holy Ghost. He talked in tongues. He went to church every time they had revivals in the church and the Holy Ghost would move and they would get slain in the spirit. And so I'm standing looking at the statue and I'm thinking, God, why me? Why did you deliver Claudette? And this boy didn't get delivered and he died lost. And I'm crying. And this man comes up to me and says, excuse me, I know you. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, my name's Claudette Walker, and you are? And he told me his name. He said, no, 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 I don't know your name. I know you by the Spirit. You have the Holy Ghost, don't you? I said, yes, I do. And he and I are both standing there with tears dripping down our face. He said, I want to tell you something. I feel God's impressing me to tell you. He said, I knew a man who was personal friends with Elvis. He said, he went to Graceland not long before he died. And Elvis told my friend, I would give every ounce of my faith. I would give every penny of my fortune if just once I could go back to that little church in Tupelo and feel what I used to feel when the anointing and power of God flowed through me. Let the Lord pound your stakes. Elvis Presley lost the greatest treasure he ever in this life according to his own admission. And I knew then the Holy Ghost had sent me to interject with that man right there. Oh, young people don't believe the lie. I don't care how many of your friends are talking to you. The grass is not greener on the other side. There are demons on the other side. There is debauchery on the other side. There is hell on the other side. There's no glory. There's no power. There is no anointing. There's no authority. There's no presence. Would you stand with me in closing? I believe, Sister Haney, it's like the tale of two cities. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. I'm not going to have time to go over this, but the Holy Ghost took me last week how to end this, and he had me to study. You can study it when you go home. Brother Morgan's actually preached it the first night, mentioned it. Study Ezekiel 9, 10, and 11. It's about the glory of God in the temple and how Israel was sinning and God departed. You'll read first how the glory and presence of God filled the house. They kept sinning. They wouldn't repent. The glory moved to the threshold. The glory moved to the eastern gate. And finally, the glory moved out on the mountain. And the sinning, backslidden Israelites had no clue he was gone. They just kept going through the ritualistic form and having church in the temple. 
It is the worst of times. Because there is a storm, the Antichrist is getting ready to set up his kingdom. There are seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and the spirit of Antichrist that aren't just sort of working. They're working like they have never worked. There's not just a falling away. There's a great falling away. And there are many churches that used to be full of the power of God that God's given them time to repent. But he is gradually backing up his Shekinah presence and glory from among them, among them, among them, among them. That's the worst of times. But hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. People, I'm here with a good word. It is the best of times for us. We're not in Ezekiel 9, 10, and 11. And please study it. We're in Ezekiel 47. Then my God brought me again to the door of the house of the Lord, the temple, and behold, waters issued forth out of the temple. Then he brought me by way to the north gate, and the waters were running in just a trickle. Verse 3. The angel brings him and causes me to pass through the waters, and now the waters are at my ankles. I'm pressing toward his holiness. You get in the next verse and the waters are coming up to his knees. But now if the waters are to my knees, I still have a little control. I believe, Sister Haney, I can't even swim. But the few times I've been in water, you can still sort of navigate like this if it's to your knees. And then the water gets up to his thighs. And it's getting harder and harder now for flesh to be in control. And then all of a sudden, you get over to the best news of all. Sister Joy, Kim Haney and I were talking about this. You get down to verse 5. And afterward, he measured it a thousand cubics. And it was a river I could not pass through. Waters to swim in. A river that could not be passed. Waters of the living God that are so strong, that are moving with such sovereignty that I can't control it at all. I've just got to get in the current. I've just got to get in the current and let it flow. And everywhere that water goes, people are going to be healed. People are going to be touched. People are going to be delivered. People are going to be saved like we have never seen before. This is the outpouring we have prayed for our entire lives. The good news is, you've kept your covenant. You've been willing to pay the price. And you have power. You have glory. You have anointing. You have authority. You have angels. You have churches where pastor have guarded the Shekinah presence of the living God. And have waited on this last day outpouring. And you and I. We're not going to be a part of it. We are a part of it. I didn't know what to do about the altar call. And I told Sister Haney, maybe you should do it. I I just can't get clear direction. But at 2 o'clock this morning, it came. And it came fast. We're not going to have to travail all day long unless the Holy Ghost asks us to, and then I'll be glad to, won't you? But God gave me six directives for this altar call. Here's what we're going to do. Sister Stephanie is going to sing for us just solo. You can join with her if you want to. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The morning after my deliverance, Cleveland Beckton was teaching the class at Tennessee camp. I miss Brother Beckton. Before he started teaching, he just said, I just feel the sweet presence of the Lord this morning. And Kids, let's just raise our hands and sing. Turn. Sing it with me just once. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the fields of earth will grow strangely Directions for the altar call. I would like if your husband is a minister, if your husband is a licensed minister, general 
local, ordained, pastor, evangelist, teacher, whatever, if you're a minister's wife, as she begins to sing, I want you to make your way quickly to the front, as close as you can get in here. All the minister's wives first, first and come quickly. Just come quickly. If your husband's a minister of any sort with the UPC, please come. And let's line as close as we can get right here. All the minister's wives, come quickly. Look in his wonderful face. And let's worship. Let's not leave the spirit of worship. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Just enter into your own zone with him and thank him. Halabaka. Okay, that's good. I know that we will not all fit in this altar area. So now I would ask for the rest of you just as quickly as you can to come in behind them. Let's come as close as we can, as many get in the altar area. If you will not fit in the altar area, feel free to come up closer in the first pews or in the aisles. Let's just come as a unified body because God is going to do something tremendous for here in a few minutes. Look in his world. I want everybody to feel free to get in the altar. Sister we'll Stephanie's going to quit singing. We're all going to, I'll be up here, but the rest of you, let's get in the altar area. Thank you, people. Thank you for your cooperation. We're just going to let the Holy Ghost move here. Like I said, I don't know. I don't think it'll be long what the Lord told me we should do. Thank you, Sister Stephanie. And you can join us in the altar area. Now, if you would just listen for instruction, I'm going to be like the prayer leader, choir leader, or whatever, when I pray and tell you what to do. We're going to pray and we're going to pray in unison. First off, the Lord told me we need to reaffirm our covenant. So I just want you to repeat after me. Now, if this is not in your heart, you heard, I forget which preacher it was. I believe it was Brother Morgans. I'm not sure, but talked about how you can just make a decision. You can just say, okay, I've heard enough now. If I've been struggling, there may be a few here still been struggling. If I struggle in whatever area, if with your mouth, you will say what I'm going to say, God will hear that and accept that as your repentance. Okay. So I'm just going to talk and you repeat after me, Lord, close your eyes and raise this not to me. So the Lord, let's raise our hands. Lord, right now, we want to reaffirm our covenant with you to be separate, O oh God, from this world and how we look and how we think and how we act and how we talk. Thank you for this doctoration of separation from the world. By your grace, I will obey it till the day I die. I will submit myself to your holy word. Even when I do not understand. And I will submit myself to my ordained pastor and shepherd. So now is not to embarrass anyone, but if there's anybody here that that demon of rebellion has been stalking you lately, right now I'm going to pray of a prayer of authority and everybody else pray it with me. It's going to be out of this building. If you don't want it close to you like it was close to me, I'm going to rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. Spirit of rebellion, you have no place in this holy house. If you've been talking to any lady, I resist you by the blood of Jesus. Be gone. Be gone from every lady. Deliver them right now. Let not one lady listen, oh God, to the lies of the voice of rebellion. Ho! Oh, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. If you don't want your devil, it can't stay. Now you speak to it and say, be gone. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Shut your filthy mouth. I will not listen to you ever again. Shut your mouth, demon of rebellion. I close the mouth of the demon of rebellion. I close it. Shut up in the name of Jesus. It's gone. It's gone. Let's clap. Let's clap. He can't stay in this atmosphere. Clap. Clap, 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 the chains. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ah, thank you, Jesus.
thank you for the angel of submission that second the place of the demon of rebellion. Woo, shalaba, hata, rikia. You just invited an angel to come and hang with you. Okay, number three. The Lord told me number three. We're not going to do the whole armor of God. Don't worry. Those of you who heard me teach on it, we're going to put on two pieces of the armor. We're going to put on the girdle of truth. I want you to put your hands like this right across your midsection. That's where the girdle went, the girdle of truth. And I'm going to pray and you repeat after me. Lord, right now we are putting, Lord, Jesus on our loins, the girdle of truth. God, I want to know the truth about you. I don't want to believe lies the devil tells me about you. We want to see you as you really are. I want to know the truth, oh God, about myself. I don't want to be deceived about where I am. I want to know the truth about others, oh God. Let me be able to discern these spirits Sister Walker has taught us about. Give me keen discernment against seducing spirits. Doctrines of devils and the spirit of Antichrist. And Lord, I want to know the truth about your holy word. Help us to rightly divide your word of truth. Don't let us be deceived, oh God, in this end time. Oh, hallelujah. Right now, I want you to cross your heart. Cross your chest like this. We're going to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You repeat after me. Lord, right now we're putting on the breastplate of righteousness. I have no righteousness of my own. My righteousness is as filthy rags. But I'm asking you by your blood to create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. Lord, give me a love of this apostolic truth like I've never had. I want to love it so much I'll give my life for it. Just pray in the spirit a minute. Pray over your own heart. I don't know your heart. You don't know mine. God said we can't even know it. It's desperately wicked. Ask God to cleanse your heart if there's any smell of the world, any taste of the world, any feel of the world. Do heart surgery right now, Jesus. Do heart surgery. Get your scalpel out, God. Cut away anything inside of me that's displeasing to your holiness. I put myself on the brazen altar. I want to be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight. Pray in the spirit a while. We can eat, pray like your fasting lunch. We'll get there eventually. Pray in the spirit right now. If the Lord wants to groan, let him groan. The Holy Ghost is wanting to pray right now. Some people aren't quite through. Pray in tongues, groan, pray in the spirit. Holy Ghost, pray through us. Oh, shana ma patata, shana ma patata, borendria si, borendria si, hula, hula pale eke, honda, hula paya, oh, shaba ro 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 patata. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, 
That's it, ladies. The Holy Ghost is praying through you. You may not be praying for yourself right now. You may be praying for somebody that's in danger in another state. You may be praying for a daughter. You may be praying, oh, let the Holy Ghost pray right now. We got a war right now. We got a war right now. Pick up your sword. Pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Cut against the bastions of hell that have come after your children, after your nieces, after your mom, after your husband. Fight, 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 fight. There are angels here. There's power here. There's covering here. There's glory here. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous woman availeth much to. If you take your fingers right now, don't totally stop your ears up. You can't hear what I'm saying, but in a symbolic sort of way. We're going to pray right now that God will close our ears and the ears of those we love to the voices of these spirits, to the seducing spirits, the doctrines of devils, and the spirit of Antichrist. Let's pray that God will close our own ears and the ears of those we love, that those demons that will talk will not be able to penetrate into our spiritual hearing. It's my ears. I don't want to listen, oh God. I don't want to listen to doctrines of devils or seducing spirits or the spirit of Antichrist. Lord, I pray, oh God, that you would put a plug inside the, my son's ears, oh God. Put a plug inside of our children's ears, oh God. Put a plug. Make us deaf. Make us deaf, oh God. Make us deaf to demonic spirits. Don't let us listen. Don't let us listen. Don't let us listen. Don't let us listen. Now I want you to put your ears like this. this. Repeat after me, Lord. Give me ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Give me discernment like I've never had discernment. Let me hear the voice of your written word. The voice of the preacher. And the voice of the gifts of the Spirit. Give me ears to hear what you're saying, Lord. Ah, hiya. The minister's wives are up front. If you are a minister's wife, would you please raise your right hand big and high. I believe you all have, in obedience, come up front. Thank you so much. Sister Kim Haney felt like this. We need to have a united prayer, and I totally agree for all the minister's wives. If you're close to a minister's wife, you're right behind them. Please touch them. Lay your hands on them. You have no idea. You have no idea. You have no idea. 
when you're not only battling for yourself and your family, but you're battling for an entire congregation and you're having to listen to these other voices and you're having to help people. It is not an easy thing, but ministers, wives, be encouraged. God is going to give you greater glory, anointing, discernment, power, wisdom than you've ever had in your life. Stretch your hand toward these holy women of God and let's pray for the ministers, wives, that they will be keen, they'll be strong, that they'll love the Word. God, I plead the blood over every minister's wife that she would fall in love with the Word like she's never fallen in love with the Word. Oh, God, give a spirit of revelation to every one of them, God. Give them wisdom to stand by their husbands in this evil day. Give them strength, oh, God. Bless every minister's wife, oh, God. Let her discern in the Spirit. Let the gifts flow. 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 Riha Shaya. Oh, give him a will to war. Give him a will to war. Give him a will to war. Give him a will to war, Lord. Where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Would you say that with me? Where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. So the battle is intense. So it is constant, preacher's wife. Be encouraged. You're going to have more power, more anointing, more authority, more glory, more help than you've ever had. You are not alone. And if you feel alone, you find you another preacher's wife who's older than you. You latch yourself onto her and say, help me, help me. We got to help each other in this day. Oh, Shalabaha. This is our last prayer unless Sister Haney feels led after I turn it over her to, to do whatever. This is the last thing the Lord told me. It's 2 o'clock this morning. I'm still feeling after the altar call and can't get it yet. And like, brrr, fast as I could write. And when I got to this last directive from the Holy Ghost, man, I got excited. My poor one adrenal gland that's about worn out. I was born with one, and it's just exhausted from what I do. I got it so fired up and geared up at 2 o'clock this morning. It was still 3.30, and the alarm was going off at 6, and I couldn't go to sleep. It was like, whoa, I can't wait to be there. It's because of what the Holy Ghost said. The Lord said to me, you know how I used to go into the city every now and then? And it was written in the word that he healed all, everybody say all, all. who were oppressed of the devil. The Lord told me if we would submit, like I believe you have in this altar here, that there ain't no reason. Not one from the tiniest child who has the Holy Ghost through the oldest gray-haired lady here has to leave this building oppressed in any way by any demonic spirit. He named five. I've been to Stockton enough, y'all know I just... It's all out there. I tell you all my warts and hang-ups and flaws. and I just go tell you how bad I am and everybody goes home feeling better because they're doing better than Sister Walker was. So anyway, I, I've told you enough of my struggles. But in my travels around the world and in the States, these five spirits, more than any at least that I've encountered in dealing with women one-on-one, -on -one, trouble us still from time to time. Now, I'm not saying it's a stronghold in your life. It might be, but it may just be a voice you have to listen to every now and then. Just something you struggle with. How many of you ever battle with a spirit of fear? Sister Walker, raise her hand. Spirit of fear. Okay, put your hand down. How many of you ever battled with a depressive spirit or an oppressive spirit? We're talking, let's say, in the last year. Now, maybe not that it had you down, pinned down or whatever, but you, you heard its voice. Doubt, unbelief. It's not sure God's going to do what he said he's going to do. You want to, but you hear it. You hear the voices. I'm not saying you're possessed. and You understand what I'm talking about. Just talking to you. Talking, 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 talking. talking. Devil's going to talk. He's a good talker. Jealousy, envy. Wishing your life was a little different. Wish I had what she had. Wish I didn't have what I had. Self-pity. Oh, my God. Lord, forgive us all. Now, if it's just a voice that every now and then goes, Oh, poor you. You got it so bad. It's real faint. I'm not talking about that kind of attack. I'm talking about something that's been really on your case lately. I mean, you've been hearing it. Like I was hearing that dumb voice of rebellion just over and over and over. It's just like you want to turn it off. You get out to pray and it's there. 
just won't shut up. Well, guess what, saints? Right now, we're going to have a massive prayer. You follow me in directive. We're going to use the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And God told me every woman can walk out of here today absolutely delivered from any one of these oppressive spirits. If I didn't name your devil, well, you name your devil. And we're going to pray right now in the name of Jesus against every demon that has dared to oppress any of you holy women of God in the last year in any way. Raise your hands right now. In the name of Jesus. We are coming by the blood of your stripes. We are coming, Lord, under the authority of the cross. And we are speaking to these demonic spirits to be far from us in the name of Jesus Christ. To steal your voices from talking to us. We are declaring that we live in the strong tower of the name of Jesus. We are declaring that the blood of Jesus scares the devil to death. And so we say the blood of Jesus is against you, spirits of hell. Be gone right now in the name of Jesus. Shout! Shout unto God with a voice of triumph! Shout unto God with a voice of prayer! You're free! You're free! You're free! Every one of you are free! Now we can sing a devil, get out of my life song. I love them all, but we don't have to, because he's gone. <laughs> However, there are scriptures in the word, do a study of aha. It's a devil's mocking word, Psalm 35, aha. I have swallowed her up, aha. Have you ever heard the devil mocking you? Aha, Claudette Walker, you and your big mouth trial over the world. I've got you pinned down by a spirit of affliction. And you've been dealing with the spirit of fear. You know you have. You've been dealing with oppression. You've been, you've been, you've been hypocrite. He's gone. And since he mocks me, how many of you ever mocks you? Makes fun of you. Tells you you ain't going to make it. My favorite verse in the Old Testament. Fell four times in 2008. Not proud of it, quite clumsy. Fell down my stairs. Fell off the crutches. Fell off the rolling walker. And fell in a church in China. And ended up for a year in a wheelchair and crutches. I ain't saying that because I'm spiritual. I'm saying it because I was clumsy. But my life verse that year was, since I fell four times, I changed it a little bit. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. For though I fall, though I fall, though I fall, though I fall, I shall arise, I shall arise, I shall arise, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord is going to be a light unto me. Don't mock me, devil, because I'm back up. And I'm mocking you. I'm mocking you. I'm mocking you. You made fun of us long enough. You've lied to us long enough. You're the loser here. You were defeated at the cross, Satan. So our final act of worship is going to be a little weird. In the last year, I don't know why, but the Holy Ghost from time to time, when I'm not sitting in darkness and the Lord's been a light unto me and he's got me up on my feet and going, I'm praying. And it's not tongues. It's not groanings, 
But it happens quite often. It sounds something like this. I don't know why. It just sounds kind of like a roar to me. And since the devil roars and mocks us, I would like this afternoon while I go take a nap because I'm exhausted for him to have to stay up with an Excedrin PM headache because he heard, I'm bad at numbers, hundreds of ladies at CLC roar, a mocking roar against everything he's done to you in the last year. Do it with me. Thank you for victory. Whatever. 